Good morning, everyone. While they're just getting my slide up, um, I should just perhaps start off uh, with a little story. <clears throat> um, when I was 17, I was sent off to India <clears throat> because I was in love and my parents felt that going to India would disabuse me of this idea and that I would be ingrained in uh, cultural traditions and practices and that I would come back and hopefully marry the person that they would choose for me. Of course, they didn't understand that uh, the space between who's now my husband and I uh, was not geography, it was time. I had to wait for 21 so I could marry who I wanted to. In those days, you had to be 21. So going to India was a lovely detour. But what happened there was um, I didn't know at that stage that I would be involved in something like palliative care. I was 17 years old, and the neighbor, old lady, was dying. And every day, we had to sit with what was called uh, the Maha, oh gosh, I've forgotten the Indian term for it, but in other words, it's the long wake or the very big wake. And for almost 35 days, we sat around on the floor at this woman who was dying because you could not leave her alone at any moment. The idea was that as long as all of us were there, we could keep her life going. Um, the last night that I chose not to be there was the night she died. <clears throat> Almost exactly 35 years to that event, I have Laura Campbell knock on my door and say, Dr. Amin, I want to do a PhD uh, in palliative care and I want to design an instrument to measure palliative care. I almost fell off my chair laughing. I thought, well, how on earth would you measure palliative care, about taking care as a, as a tool? And so that started that journey, uh, which took us three years. And Laura um, then did her PhD. And we thought it was all about context. So I've come to realize now that all the work that I'd been doing around context was really around decolonization. And I'm wondering now whether if we use relevant contextual education, whether that would take away the political uncertainties and the undesirables that go with the term decolonization. So I'm just throwing that around at you. I must say that my own mother, her palliative care, the period, of dying was 37 years. <clears throat> it was very painful to watch a person descent into pain and un unable to, to manage that pain. Um, and it was very, very painful. In fact, I didn't want to get married eventually because I felt I couldn't leave my mom uh, to manage on her own. Um, but eventually she said, no, uh, you've got your life to lead. So um, it's really poignant for me that as I was plotting my life, others were dying around me. So what I'm going to share with you is a series of papers uh, that I'd started writing about before I met Laura around context. And the first paper I wrote uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, Labby Ramratan, was about how do we prepare teachers for the contextual diversity of South Africa. That means, how do you prepare a teacher to go in, because they don't know where they're going. We prepare teachers as if they're all going to end up in a first world school. Yes. That's what we pretend it's all about. And then you send them to a rural school without walls. So that was the first one. And the... And the model that was developed then, the approach, was then used for Laura's study, which is called Certain the Curriculum, Uncertain the Context. So that was a thesis, that you can have a curriculum that is so certain, 
but it becomes impossible to use because of the context. So Laura's study centered around palliative caregivers in rural KwaZulu-Natal. Her job was to prepare volunteer palliative caregivers for the rural space. Now here is something that we have to say something about the political structuring and the unfairness of health provisioning in the country. So if you're black, you don't care. Your life doesn't matter. You don't deserve proper hospitals and care. You don't even deserve fully qualified palliative caregivers. We'll just go and find some gogos in the area and we'll give you some very quick education to go and provide palliative care. Now let's look at the context from the palliative caregiver's position. You may not prescribe drugs for pain. And we know palliative care, one of the chief functions and roles is to reduce pain. But you have no right to do that. So you go to the homes and you're supposed to wash the bodies, change the bandages of sores and things like that that nobody in the family wants to do. You become a witness to how people treat people who are dying. Sometimes they're thrown in a little hut, a makeshift thing outside on a broken bed. Often there isn't enough food. And so the palliative caregivers who were volunteers would often carry food from their own homes to give to these. And when they go there, they see little children who also have not eaten. So you don't only feed the one who's dying, you've got to feed those that are living as well, who have a life to live towards. So these are the kinds of things that the caregivers were facing. But even worse, the minute they entered the space, they were accused of being the bearer of bad news. Your mere presence signals that this person is going to die and therefore you're wishing for death to come. And so some of them were abused, some of them were chased, some of their lives were in danger. So what we find in this, we have this curriculum which is supposed to have prepared them to teach in a rural space. But all it did was to create more challenges for the caregivers. There was another problem, and that these caregivers were insiders to Zulu culture. Their own belief system was that our culture caters for life for everyone, not just those who are dying. So how do I only provide care to those that we have decided are going to die and ignore the others? Also, the patient said, but you know better. You're one of us. You know that the Western medicine is not for us. Where's our traditional healers? The problem gets even more complicated when some of these were placed in a hospice. Because in a hospice, one of the traditions of some of these families was that you want to do some animal sacrifice. You want to do some prayer, but you're not allowed to do it in the hospital. As you said, it was allowed before. Remember for the West, hospitals and the church next door is very normal. But for us, and maybe I should throw the question, who's an African? Because would I want a traditional healer who's from the, Isi Zulu, from the Zulu culture, or do I want somebody from an Indian culture? But I'm not even an Indian. I don't even know what I am. <laughs> so that's another problem. So we have all these complications from the viewpoint of the caregivers. And that just shows the lack of dignity and respect for people of an African origin who are dying. 
And so it really makes us think about what is this curriculum about? And how is it that we can integrate cultural values, spiritual values, pain management into the space? Because certainly what Laura and I came to realize is that perhaps we need a little bit of that and a little bit of that. And that, that would be one of the pitfalls that if we go entirely the traditional route, we might run into some problems. But let me give you another scenario about people in the rural areas who are identified as those requiring palliative care. What Laura's study found is that we were often not sure whether people had a life-limiting condition or a life-limiting disease. Now, there's a difference between the two. A life-limiting disease means that you probably have cancer or a really bad heart or advanced diabetes for which we know that death is imminent. But there are others who are regarded as being at death's door, not because they have a disease, because they are starving. So they're facing death because they do not have nutritional, have nutrition. So this feeds into the narrative that a miracle can happen at any time. Because that's what the patients were saying. That, and the families, that as long as there's life, there's hope, and a miracle can happen. And we suspect, but we have no proof from the study, that those who recovered probably were not dying of a disease that had doomed them, that perhaps just the proper medication and nutrition, some vitamins and so on, and they were back on life. But because they survived, there was this idea that a faith healer can bring about a miracle. But even if that's not true, can we take that hope away from somebody who's dying? And should we do that? And so, of course, we've come to the conclusion that in order to provide a relevant and appropriate palliative care for uh, people in the rural areas that we must somehow involve traditional healers, members of the family, spiritual needs and so on. Because everyone's spiritual need is not a Christian one. It could be something else. So how do we do that in a curriculum? I think that is the challenge and maybe I shall deal with that now. So, um, of course, how you see the curriculum as a full, half full or half empty is, is a point of view. So, uh, just to tell you, this was the scholarship on which it was based. Um, we've done quite a number of uh, papers on, um, on palliative care. <clears throat> I must say, Laura was my first PhD student to take somebody from the medical field uh, was really a challenge. Uh, but to get her study passed by the examiners, I chose the biggest names in palliative care, the women who controlled six of the top journals in the world in palliative care to examine her thesis. And I chose them because I felt th the study needs to go elsewhere. So in keeping in mind that audience, I made sure that the first chapter was written to talk about the benefits of Western medicine and what it had to offer us. Okay, so it gave us medication, it gave us uh, symptoms that could be for use for diagnostic purposes and so on. So there's very much good that is from the Western. And then we said, what are its limitations? Especially when you're working in the field of uncertainty. Life and death are certainties, but we never know when. That's the catch. 
uh, so that we could make it more palatable for this audience. So it was sort of playing the examination game as well. Um, and so we began to look at practice. So what is the practice of training people to work in a palliative care space? Whether this is in people's home in the rural area, in a hospice, or wherever. The first thing we decided is that the patient matters. So it means placing the person first. Curriculum comes second. But what we then did was to say, let's take a hard look at the curriculum. And when we looked at the curriculum, this is what we found. That there was what we call a hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is that part of the curriculum which has unintended learnings, learnings that were never designed, but which happen. So just to give you a simple example, if there's paper lying on the floor and you're a teacher standing in front and you tell the children, pick up the paper, you think you're teaching them to keep the place clean. What the kids are actually learning is, Ah, I must wait till I'm an adult, then I can order somebody else to pick up the paper. <laughs> huh? Because you think, so if you want them to learn, you, you tell them, help me to clean the class. And then you pick up the paper with them. And so we found that in this curriculum, there was a lot of hidden stuff. So for example, the palliative caregivers who were brought in, Whatever they had to learn about palliative care was simultaneously a dissing of their own spiritual and contextual and cultural practices. What we were saying is, that's not important. What we're telling you to do, that is the important thing. So through the hidden curriculum, you learn to start rejecting your own practices, your own beliefs, your own ideologies, and so on. And you know, Let's not pretend as medical people. Medicine is the most uncertain discipline you can have. We don't know why medicine works. You all know about the what effect they call it? Placebo. The placebo effect, OK? We really haven't answered that. We don't know whether medication works because you believe it works or because you think, I don't think this thing is good for my body. I, I'm typical of that. Every time I go for surgery, I just tell myself I've got the best doctors they are going to fix me up. I come out cognitively damaged again, but I still believe in them. <laughs> you, you know? so, so that's the hidden curriculum. Then we have what we discovered was a restricted, enacted curriculum. So, you know, this was the funny thing is that the, the palliative caregivers know that the people don't want them to talk about death. But because of their training, they still go and say, well, now you've got to prepare for death. What if this person dies? The family doesn't want to hear about death. But you just insist. So you become very restricted in the way you operate because you really believe that the doctors and nurses, the actual trained ones, know better than I do about the people in my culture, my linguistic group, and so on. And the thirdly, we found the null curriculum. The things that should be in the curriculum that are not there. And that is about how we deal with differences of belief systems and how we deal with uh, people who, who have their own ideas about how we take care of those who are facing death. See, all of us are facing death here. We just don't know it. Okay? Fortunately, we don't need painkillers to live with that either. But those who are at the front, uh, at the fr co-face of this. So what we found is that the nurses, the volunteers, were highly traumatized. And the only way to deal with that kind of trauma is to deal with it from a curriculum perspective. 
Now, I don't have much time to talk about my own framework, which is post-structural. And a post-structural framework questions the kinds of truths, questions the notions of knowledge, questions the nature of reality. And when you question, it means that you have to work totally within an uncertain frame. And what we're saying is that if you pass those three through a post-structural frame, that you can fall into the space of unknowns. And once you're in the space of unknowns, you can have what is called a curriculum without borders. And I've written a chapter on it, which we just launched the book yesterday. Mershon was there. The book is called Undoing Cognitive Damage, uh, in which we're saying that everyone is cognitively damaged in the absence of physiological damage. Okay? <laughs> Those who have the power and they abuse it. Those who are victims of power. And the neutrals, most of us who do nothing, we're just observers. So all of us are damaged in some way or the other. But if you have a curriculum without borders, that means a curriculum that is so porous that it allows you to push things in and out as you will. So you have kind of a basic curriculum. And then depending on who you have, because now you've got to connect with the humans in your class, you can put in stuff and change and make it relevant and appropriate to a context. Because as Spivak told us yesterday, we've been serving theory. Maybe it's time to serve people. And so you start people first. And I'm glad that this entire thing, uh, colloquium, was based around the notion of human dignity. I would just say that we take it a little further as we're moving into a post-human future, that perhaps humans are not the most important. And so now I'm going to undo everything that I said. Yes. There are seven billion people on the planet. If we lose a few million, it should be no harm, as long as it's not you and I. <laughs> but perhaps everything else on the planet matters as well. The environment, animals, <coughs> Because, you know, when one life is pitted against a lion or a huge orangutan, who might just be one of 300 left on the planet, we'll kill that animal and preserve the one of 7 billion. We have too many of. So we have to think about all of this. But I think the bottom line for me is those who are dying deserve dignity of care. And if you think of where our money is going in this country, it just makes you enormously angry that none of it is coming into my pocket. But serving one family, and yet we have thousands who could be dying just because they are starving. So I think I'll stop there.